So let me start all over. Thank you again for, for being part of this. It's always a pleasure to present um, amongst these prestigious speakers listening. I'm always learning a lot, but says I promised me that sometime after the COVID pandemic, probably in 10, 20 years, I may come to Miami again. Um, when, he, when he picked this, this title, of course, I didn't really listen, I didn't really look it up, but um, radiology of, of ID-131 sounded challenging to me because it's far beyond the daily business. And um, so I worked on it and I'm going to share some thoughts. This is first my disclosures. I'm cooperating with uh, several companies, but it's always important for me to say I'm also interacting with patient support groups, um, international uh, patient support groups, and also on a national basis. When we talk about uh, safety, uh, we also need to talk about risks and risks in general for thyroid cancer, of course. And I mean, all of the audience would know that there are several factors which have been proven to, to influence uh, thyroid cancer development. Others are uh, considered to be uh, increasing the risk for uh, thyroid cancer like obesity, estrogens, um, and other factors, of course. But this is not today's topic. Just as a starter, there is also some influence of your alcohol consumption. And if I interpret these numbers right, uh, light to moderate drinkers um, have a lower risk um, of developing thyroid cancer compared to non-drinkers. So Cesar has to invite us for a drink. Um, there are other factors. Um, you can see it from, from the table here, but probably the most important one or one that has been shown in multiple occasions is radiation and uh, exposure to radiation. We all know that, and uh, this is a little excursion here, we all know that from the uh, Fukushima accident, we know it from uh, the uh, Chernobyl accident, which happened uh, in 1986. And these days, uh, especially in Europe, um, we think about these accidents and we think about uh, recommendations of uh, iodine thyroid blocking. Actually, being the president of our Nuclear Medicine Association in Germany, I'm confronted with many questions addressing this issue. Um, so just as a reminder, and then I'm going to stop talking about uh, things that happen in our neighborhood. Um, it's especially used to prevent highly vulnerable groups. So we're not talking about the elderly, we just talk about fetuses, children, pregnant, breastfeeding women, because they are at high risk of developing thyroid cancer after exposure to radioiodine. And if you want to block your thyroid, you should use 100 to 1,000 times more than the usual dietary, dietary intake. So we're not talking about micrograms anymore, we're talking about milligrams. And all these recommendations are based on our experiences from the incidences I mentioned before. And this is most important that you, if you, you expect an exposure, um, you should take your iodine pills about six to eight hours before uh, the, the, the actual fallout, um, because if you take it much later, it won't help anymore. But this is all I'm going to say about iodine blocking. And now I'm moving to theranostics, and we heard about that. Um, I think it's a fascinating concept, and it's um, well established in nuclear medicine. Probably would even say we invented the whole thing. Um, it's about uh, diagnostic tests in combination with therapy for an individual patient, the right dosage, and it should be as targeted as possible. And it's uh, created from the two Greek words, diagnosis and prognosis and therapy. So we want to test patients for a possible response, and then we tailor the therapy based on these test results. It can involve pharmacogenetics, proteomics, biomarkers, profiling, and so on. And in nuclear medicine, it's quite easy to apply. You would even call it radiotheranostics. So one example would be a diagnostic scan that could predict the uptake on a post-therapy scan to a certain extent. 
And this is, as I said before, uh, nothing new. It has been there for almost 80 years now, and it's all linked to radii. Radiobiology, if you want to look for a definition, um, it's the interaction of ionizing radiation on molecular structures and, of course, the resulting effects organs, tissues, normal, and disease. And this plays an important role, and I'm going to come back to this in a minute. Um, actually, yesterday I asked Cesar because he hadn't had the article already, and he was so kind to send it to me. This is a letter to the editor, and I'm going to bore some patients here. Probably not Dr. Nostrand, but Mike Tuttle, I'm quite sure, is going to be bored because um, I teased him many times before that, of course, uh, we talk about gray when we talk about radiation and we talk about mimicries when we talk um, and when we're addressing the amount of activity that would be administered. Some more explanations here. Internal radionuclide therapy has a different dose rate, and that's something that needs to be considered over and over again. Um, a different dose rate as compared to external beam. And um, actually, this author stated that um, there should be predictable dose response effects. Quite optimistic if you really want to call it predictable, but there must be a close relation. The critical parameter is, of course, the absorbed dose to the tissue, and this is expressed in gray. And one milligram, 70, 37 megabags, may lead to a dose ranging from one gray to 100 gray. And that's something we need to keep in mind. So what you administer does not naturally result in a fixed dose response effect that can be completely different. And if you look for meaningful outcomes, and we also say that this in our modernic uh, 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 principles, we need to calculate this. Absorbed dose rates and dose dis distributions vary and the biological response also is very different. So digging a little deeper, one can discriminate targeted and non-targeted effects in the organ and um, in the tissues uh, as a response to targeted radiotherapy. And it's all about the efficacy of the treatment that should be balanced to the adverse effects, potential adverse effects. I'm going to spend most of the, my talk discussing potential adverse effects of radioiodine treatment. Also, if you want to look into future concepts, we touched this already, um, radiosensitizing strategies or radioprotectant uh, agents when it comes to salivary glands, um, that plays an important role. More systematic um, approach, we're looking for healthy tissue response, tumor response. Also, we aim for a combination therapy like radiosensitizing or chemotherapy in combination with radionuclide therapy. We need to know about this patient specific radiosensitivity. There's a huge variety in sensitivity with a genetic background and the underlying anom anomalies and also tumor specific, specific radio sensitivity. Um, again, target distribution and also microenvironment heterogeneity. We heard uh, uh, about that in uh, Yuri's talk. And there are multiple cellular matters that can be touched and that can be attacked by radio iodine. Here's a list of different structures, and this may call uh, oxidative stress, inflammation, and so on. And as I said before, there's a huge difference between conventional external beam radiotherapy and targeted uh, radionuclide therapy. And this can be read from this nice illustration here. Um, the dose rates are completely different. The dose distribution is different, and of course, the kind of irradiation, like in nuclear medicine, we have alpha, beta, and Auger electrons. That's completely different what uh, we would expect from external beam radiotherapy. 
already mentioned targeted effects, uh, which would include crossfire radiation and self irradiation. And we're not so sure about this dose effect uh, relationship here. And we also have non targeted uh, effects, which would uh, be based to inflammation, macrophages, and cytokines, of course. And all this finally should lead to cell death, cell survival, and in some instances also carcinogenesis. So coming back to the patient, um, they are of course interested in a risk benefit evaluation, which risk is associated with a certain therapy. And there is a lot of controversial literature out there. And um, I always show this uh, cartoon because we do our best to not overtreat patients, but also try to avoid undertreatment of cancer patients. For that, uh, some uh, doctoral students of mine and my team uh, did a literature analysis, and it took us over a year to put all this together because we really tried to do it as professional as possible. And this resulted in a nice publication that was, and I'm very happy about that, just accepted by the European Journal of Nuclear Medicine. And, and I'm gonna show you a few of the findings from this endeavor. Um, no big surprise, there are multiple articles um, dealing with this phenomenon. We had a look at various uh, sources here, Cochrane, Medline, PubMed, and so on. We excluded duplicates, still having more than 5,000 publications ready. We had a full text review of 69 papers and finally ended up uh, only with 10 papers with all the inclusion uh, criteria fulfilled because we had to really sort out a lot of uh, 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 papers that were not fulfilling the evidence standards, which is probably not a big surprise because there are almost no, or there are no, prospective trials. So we had a very grim look at the quality of the data. We had a look at papers that were published in the years 1973 to 2020, almost 50 years, and I already showed you 10 out of 69 full papers were finally analyzed. We included meta-analysis and systematic reviews, and respite. Um, it was sometimes not so sure what the design of the study was. I'm kind of going to come back to bias in a minute. The sample size uh, ranged from 180 to more than 200,000, which was mainly based on the SEER database. Um, of course, we considered multiple parameters here, especially number of study participants, description of the cohort, follow-up interval, and study design. The most important uh, parameters that we were looking for is the cumulative activity, fractionation, administered activity per course, per treatment course, the latency period until the appearance of a secondary malignancy, and actually at what time point uh, would a second uh, malignancy be considered linked to the exposure? That's one of the crucial questions. Um, what about SPMs before DTC? Initial histology, thyroid carcinoma, histology, and uh, proportion of women, children, age. There's going to be a sub analysis published um, in the future. Sometimes uh, authors didn't even report on uh, prior treatments like chemotherapy or external beam. The statistical methods used were also looked up, but sometimes remained unclear. There was number, a high number of participants lost to follow up. That's quite common in, in thyroid cancer studies, when if you go for a long period of time, and of course, multiple unrecognized confounders should be, may be present. And we also looked for special limitation sources of bias and remarks. So I already mentioned this, that was something we had a long discussion about. One, what you call a, a, a second malignancy, secondary malignancy, metachronic or synchronic. Is there a cutoff? Of course not. 
it's it's a spectrum it's a continuous uh, development and nobody really knows organs at risk uh, multiple breast bone marrow lung kidney prostate femur reproductive organ stomach colorectal salivary glands the central nervous system and also soft tissue and here are some of the studies we analyzed just to give you brief overlook what we did this is one of the largest studies actually 20,000 patients enrolled study from taiwan which may play a role and the authors could show that there is an increase of uh, malignancies after 20 years or so but the conclusion was um, that thyroid cancer may be associated with an increased risk of second malignancy but they also said that a cause or relationship could not be established based on their data. So there are multiple other influencer factors like environment, um, especially it's different to the Western population, uh, nutrition habits and so on, lifestyle is completely different. Another study here, which looks impressive at first glimpse, you see the, the uh, uh, um, higher incidence uh, with radioiodine and much lower with no uh, radioiodine. But as a nuclear medicine uh, a physician, I would ask for a dose response relationship. And you see there is no, diff uh, no close relation between the amount, the activity of radioiodine administered and the consequences. So mm, weak uh, uh, evidence. Overall, there seems to be, um, which is probably not a big surprise, higher rates of salivary gland malignancies, probably uh, renal, kidney, and uh, for sure, hematologic malignancies after, and I'm going to show that in a minute, high exposure to radioiodine. But there are also many random effects, so sometimes um, radioiodine exposure even seems protective for some tumors. So it's quite complex. That's the least I can say. And coming back to the issue of timing, most of the uh, uh, secondary malignancy was, would appear after five years or so, and then it's going down again. And the cumulative uh, 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 number is, of course, the highest after 25 years, 30 years or so. Much easier to assess, but usually it's not done in a routine uh, scenario, is that you have a drop in leukocytes and platelets after immediately, actually, after radioiodine exposure, after six weeks or so, there's a nadir here, and then it goes back to normal levels again, and we assessed that some years ago. I think this was Mike Tuttle's group showing that after radioiodine exposure, the risk for <coughs> CML is uh, increased and uh, we also found that and we also found that in literature but at least in our hands whenever there was a, a, a leukemia um, present this was linked to very high activities so two out of 200 and these were metastatic patients and they were treated multiple times and the activity rate uh, went up to 60 gigabytes which is quite uncommon scenario but these are these patients are really threatened by their underlying disease. These patients could die of thyroid cancer. So we kept on treating. And that was some years ago, of course, probably now we would have switched to other types of treatment. But all I want to show is that uh, leukemia is linked to very high exposure. We didn't see that in low exposure. And this shows the same thing. It's um, great, uh, gigabecquerels uh, administered, and you see the number of, um, of, of secondary malignancies. And there's a lot of gray zone here. And the only one really demonstrating the huge steep increase is in the range of up to 40 gigabecs administered. This shows the same, and, and, and you can see that in a normal range, so to speak, what we do in our daily practice um, the activity is much lower and there is not such a clear phenomenon uh, regarding neoplasms. Of course, there are other 
drawbacks of radii and exposure. You have to be aware of that. Thrombocytopenia, at least transient, uh, other blood uh, uh, count uh, uh, numbers go down. Um, there is an FSH increase in, <coughs> in, in women and uh, multiple other factors like salivary gland damage. And that's probably from a, per, a patient perspective even more relevant because it impacts your quality of life. But again, no clear cut data. And one of the questions is how to assess salivary glands. Um, how would you do that? Do an IDA one to four pet? Very uh, uh, probably over the top, but it has been done. And this is just an image showing you salivary gland metabolism from the Jensen study. What we do about that is there is stimulation. Does it make sense to stimulate with uh, uh, lemon juice or candies? Probably not. We don't know exactly what the ideal procedure would be to protect sal salivary glands, but uh, we're not so sure about uh, our protocols here. And that's something we probably should focus on. Um, the documented uh, pathologies are, of course, function uh, or restriction in the function, uh, inflammation, lacrimal gland uh, dysfunction, and of course, a certain rate of uh, malignancies. But again, there is no close relation to the activity. You see on the right hand side, the highest activity, more than 37, and actually inflammation is even lower. This is pretty old data, but I'm not aware that this has been shown on the contrary that there is a close relation. So I refer you to our publication and you can tell probably the listener I'm pretty proud about this publication because we invested a lot of time and effort and it should be uh, as a preprint or uh, should be readable soon in the European Journal. What will we do to, to avoid these uh, negative consequences? You should avoid pregnancies for some time after exposure, conception of course. Um, in case of higher activities in young boys and girls, um, uh, some, some, some measures should be taken like uh, cryoconservation of sperm. And of course patients due to potential salivary gland damage should be encouraged to use uh, dental hygiene. Relative contraindications um, are high-grade bone marrow de de depression, significant impairment of pulmonary function after exposure and after high uptake in the lungs. And of course, if um, one could discuss if there is already sclerostomia, if you should still expose patients to radioiodine. And we actually, we deal with the same problem we go for alpha PSMA therapy these days uh, for thyroid, uh, for prostate cancer patients. We're far away, and Luca knows that we're far away from standardization. Um, we just had this this uh, questionnaire for for the thyroid committee of the ENM, and there were multiple cases, and you had to say if you want to expose this patient to radiata, yes or no. And this is a complicated cartoon, but I'm going to show you the results. This is um, the huge variation what the experts, uh, Luca is part of that, I was part of that, some others. There is no standardization and different approaches uh, all over Europe. And that's one of the drawbacks. We need to come to a higher standardization there to really compare uh, outcomes, to compare patient cohorts and to do the best for our patients. Finally, a few words on the topic of it. the symmetry. Um, Again, from the, the my title summary of our conference in Martinique, we I think we're getting there. We're getting closer to to really having uh, the symmetry implemented, and um, there are large differences in the iodine kinetics. I already showed you that, and blood dose is a good indicator for that. Another example here from Eric uh, Waberg, um, the activity needed to achieve a certain blood dose, and you can see huge variation, how much you have to give to a certain patient to really uh, achieve the same, uh, same amount. One example here, an elderly lady or a young man in our hands, they would have been treated with the same amount for, adju for adjuvant therapy and um, 
at these days, um, as Glenn Flux has put it, put it uh, currently, actually, nationality or institution is more important than kinetics or even weight. Statement from physicists from Italy, uh, the symmetry would be widely accepted. I'm not so sure about that. And I'm also not so sure about that it's really more effective. There's a battle going on within nuclear medicine and uh, we, uh, we keep on fighting about the right concept for the symmetry. And um, this is a comparison of data from the MSKCC and the, the uh, Institute Gustave Rossi in, in France. Real world data so far do not support um, the symmetry or at least question the benefit of the symmetry. So we keep on working for that, but uh, it's unanswered. The multiple challenges, there's a huge measuring error still. And again, we're getting better. And if we really can predict cure, hmm, we will see. And um, finally, I think the outlook would be that we need more studies, that we need to search for confounders. We need registries um, and we need scoring systems or some kind of standardization to assess uh, salivary glands. Um, we need better preventive measures. Patient selection is key, of course. And um, with that, um, I'd like to conclude um, coming back to the incidence of malignancies. The evidence suggests that there is an increased risk, um, but given the overall very low quality of evidence, um, of most published study, we need further research on that. Probably again, we need prospective studies because studies are not comparable. Cohorts are very heterogeneous and multiple other factors may play a role. I already discussed the problems because most of the times there were no appropriate control groups, like it's uh, just the public, which is not the best control group, and uh, imprecision plays a big role. These two guys actually did the work, and we had multiple meetings, and we tried to do our best to really uh, yeah, get the best results. And this is the marketplace in Marburg. And with that, I'd like to conclude my talk. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.